What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Made You a Mixtape podcast. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe from wherever you're listening around the world. Now, if you're new to the podcast, let me give you a brief introduction. Every every episode, we have a guest on here. We talk to them about their life, their work, and the music that made them who they are today. And I am stoked for this one because our guest today is none other than the lead singer of Lowest of the Low, Ron Hawkins and the Rusty Nails, and Ron Hawkins and the and the Do Good Assassins. Mr. Ron Hawkins himself, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, Jason. How are you? I am so stoked that you're here. Uh, I've been listening to Lowest of the Low for a long, long time. So to have you here, it's an honor for me. Um, I do have to ask, though, because we're coming out of a year and a half of literally basically no shows, how have you been this past year and a half? I've been surprisingly good, uh, apart from this, what's going on here with the hair. But um, yeah, no, I've been surprisingly good. I, 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 I've, I, you know, read and seen and 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 uh, talked about how hard it's been for a lot of people. And it's been very, uh, a mixed thing for me in terms of like feeling a little bit like survivor's guilt or something that I have, you know, lots of little projects going on and um, stuff like that. So, and with all of the, the gigs being shut down, you know, instantly there was a little bit of like, whoa, you know, like, what are we going to do? Can we hang in for how many months can we hang in like this? And luckily for me, I'm also a visual artist and I did a little switch take to, to painting. And then I sort of had a, I've had a sort of a painting uh, career um, who, that replaced the live venue uh, economically. And so I've, I've, there's been sort of no blip through it. So I feel very blessed and weirdly, uh, like I've snuck through by the skin of my teeth kind of thing. And it's been great. So, you know, other than the obvious, the world is in torment and, and, uh, you know, seeing other people um, struggling with uh, cabin fever and, you know, whatever uh, mental health issues come up around the pandemic, other than that, and being an empathetic person, I, I just, uh, for me, it's just been a, a real reset, you know, like a. I, I, I do have to ask because you, uh, the lowest of the low did do some, uh, some live stream shows, uh, during the pandemic. How was that experience like in the venue itself? Uh, it's funny. Cause I've got, I got to do a few different kinds, which is, um, when it first happened and people started talking about live streams, I was very skeptical about what, how you would, especially for a band like lowest of the low or for a performer like me, which really feeds off the kind of feedback loop of live energy. And we've built such a community over the decades that, I thought, well, you can't replace that with a video screen. It'll, it'll be super weird. But um, I started doing something called Tommy Douglas Tuesdays every Tuesday and just sort of to dip my toe into it and then found that it was such a charming uh, continuation of that live community online because I could see the chat going on too, right? I couldn't I couldn't really read too much while I was playing, but I mean, I was seeing the people who would come to our shows and, and – uh, communicate with each other we're doing it online and then i was i had this little variety show i was doing and then i did one of those uh, drive-in shows which i was very skeptical about i w- went and did it with stephen stanley who's a former guitar player in Los and low we did it at a drive-in in toronto and it was like i was like this is going to be a shit show like this will be ludicrous right what are they going to honk to applaud and so they do they honk to applaud but um again our our, our fans were so uh, are so into the songs that there are some like hand clap things that they all collectively did on their horns and there were um, call and response things that they did on their horns. So that turned out to be delightful as well. And then the low ourselves did a show at Lee's Palace, which was a live stream. And again, no audience. We felt, well, this is going to feel like a pantomime or like a little fake or something. But, you know, we just sort of leaned into the weirdness. You know, it's all you can do is sort of like, this is what we got. (laughs) Let's give it a shot, you know, and it felt great. It was a good, it was a fun show. With the with the Tommy Douglas Tuesdays, uh, you know the live streaming on Facebook, you were seeing a lot of artists take to Facebook or to Twitch or to other streaming platforms in order to be able to put on shows or to at least have that, you know, communication between you know the artists and and the fans. Um, first of all, is is there a single song from your entire discography that you've missed throughout the entire Tommy Douglas Tuesdays? And do you feel like going forward? that that kind of performance that 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 very small intermittent like kind of in between album cycle performance is going to continue you know as part of new normal yeah i don't don't know what other people think and i don't know how other people did their their live streams per se i saw a few and you know they ranged from quite elaborate to you know very primitive and mine started out pretty primitive 
and I, and I sort of dragged my feet for a little while because I couldn't get the audio of it to sound the way I could accept it. And then I sort of got over myself after about three weeks and I was like, you know, people are super, super hurting right now. And it's really not about audio file quality. It's about having a campfire to go to basically. So I started doing it. And then because it was a slightly sterile environment, uh, my daughter has a little red uh, effects machine that we got her when she was little. It has like hand claps on it and other weird noises and stuff like that. So I started to incorporate that into it. And I started to write on these cardboard signs, you know, because people were very, very generous right up front and concerned about me. And they were saying, you know, why isn't there a tip jar? Can we send money to a PayPal account? And uh, I was very uh, touched by that. And, and I just said, well, look, you know, weirdly, I'm fine. So I said, you know, rather than send the money to me, why don't you send it here? And I was holding up cardboard signs to places for PPE, for hospitals and, you know, shelters and uh, things like that. So that became part of the show. And then uh, my partner, Jill, was often sitting at this dining room table, which is off screen. But every now and then she would sort of shout something in and that would become part of the show. And even one day, like a friend of mine called, you know, forgetting that I was doing a show in the middle of the show. So we took the call live on the show. And I was like, this is just becoming kind of like a variety show. Like, you know, <laughs> and so we just, you know, whatever weirdness happens. And I would tell people sometimes like, you can't see on the other side of the camera, but we have one cat in our house that, um, inappropriately eliminates as they say and i'd be playing the show and something would be going on over here and then that cat wicket would walk by and he'd pee in front of the front door all this while i'm doing the show right so i said sometimes i just wish i could turn the camera and show everybody what was going on in the house behind them so that kind of just became such a charming thing that i think yeah i will definitely uh continue to do it when there are spates you know that it, that it seems appropriate to do you know like hey let's get back together and do that thing we did during the pandemic wasn't that weird you know yeah, it's just a whole different, a whole different thing. Because I mean, I've done lots of intimate shows for very small crowds, like a fifty-person crowd in a small room, and it has a lot of the storytelling and that kind of stuff that goes on there. But it's still even this was still even different from that in that there were I don't know, just I, I felt comfortable to stretch the stories on for you know twelve minutes. I would tell some story about a song or whatever, and people seem to be really into that too. Now, July 17th is Record Store Day here in Canada, yes. and Lowest of the Low has a release lined up for Record Store Day. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. We, we recorded a... Ah, uh... uh, there it is. We there it is. A record. Um, we were actually approached by Record Store Day to, uh, to, to say, you know, is there anything that you guys would want to do as an exclusive for Record Store Day? And we said, hells yeah. And uh, so it's a 12-inch single. Um, of, of, of two live performances we did at Lee's Palace. They were the last shows we did before the pandemic hit. And uh, we recorded those whole shows. It was a, a night at Lee's Palace and a night at the Horseshoe Tavern. And with the intentions that we would release it as a live, a double live record, one for each uh, night. And it had been, I think it's been 20 years since we did a live record. So some people were kind of clamoring for that. So we did the recordings and everything, really loved it. And we had our friends in uh, Sky Wallace and the Sky Wallace Band uh, open for us uh, both nights. And they were incorporated into the nights. We did a couple of covers that are on the live record. And um, so we had this whole, and our intention was to release it, you know, on the anniversary of those shows in 2019. So December, 2020, we wanted to release a double live record. And then of course, you know, all the nonsense happened. And um, so then we had to sit on it. We're going to, we're, it's, we're talking about releasing it this December now is two years to the day, but then we had some extra tracks that didn't make it on the, the double live record. And we thought, Hey, this is perfect. We'll do this for the 12 inch single. So it's a couple of songs on there and that'll be coming out. Yeah. July 17th. Right. Exactly. It's exactly. only vinyl and it's only a uh, record store day. Uh, it's only in select record stores. Uh, and we will be sending out a link. Record Store Day has a link of, you know, it's one of those things where you put your postal code in and it'll tell you a place close to you that has it. When you think about uh, you know, what record stores especially have gone through in this past year and a half, how important do you think this year's Record Store Day is going to be? I think it's going to be, I think that, I think the opening of the first few shows and venues, I think we're really going to have, they're going to be the litmus test of, you know, has live music and recorded music as we understand it survived this paradigm shift because you know uh, certainly it was hard enough to have a, a live music venue in 2015 2016 2017 like it was hard enough to do it's not a money-making venture for anybody it's a labor of love for anybody who opens a 
you know, an independent record store or a live venue. They do it because they love music. So it was hard enough then. And now with the shit kicking that we, that they've taken with the pandemic and there's talk, I don't know how legitimate it is or how much the insurance companies are walking it back, but there was talk about uh, insurance companies not wanting to insure live venues, you know, live venues as successful as Lee's Palace, not just little, you know, people who had just opened a little bar in the garage or something. It's like, you know, big historic venues uh, might be, might have a hard time getting insurance. And if they can't get insurance, they can't run a venue. So, so I really don't know. I mean, I, I would love to think that this record store day will just be swamped with people. Um, you know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping the whole thing is just kind of like shaking people to their core who love live music and love recorded music. And they're like, we could lose this, you know, if we don't, you know, we can't do this. Yeah, I'll go see my friend's band three gigs from now. You know, I, they're always playing. You know, we, we can't get into that mindset anymore. we got to value it and nurture it, you know? Do you think that by releasing, you know, uh, this live release for Record Store Day and, you know, people go out, they pick it up, they, they, they pop it on the record player, they put the headphones on and they hear that crowd and they feel that 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 live vibe. Do you think that a record like this is going to be almost a catharsis for some people who are just itching for that live music again? Yeah, I hope so. I hope it, I hope it's the little uh, I mean, absolutely nothing can replace being in that room. And this is the thing about the litmus test of when they open again is how comfortable people will feel when I think back on those Lee's Palace and Horseshoe shows that we, you know, we certainly didn't, we don't ever take it for granted, but I just mean, we just assumed that we would always be able to do that. And so when I think back on it now, it seems like a very precious couple of nights where, you know, the sweat is flying and people are elbow to elbow and, and, uh, you know, we're just jumping around and lying on the stage and leaning out and, you know, I think about things too, like how many microphones I've just, cause I eat the mic right. I just sing right <laughs> up on it. And, and uh, now with washing my hands and not having a cold for a year and a half, I started thinking about, man, you know, either that was really developing my immune system just to think of the gross 7,000 mics, you know, like, so I, so I don't know. I mean, like, I, I, I hope that they'll hear that crowd level rise and then the band kick in and just it'll transport them to either they were there or they've been in a thousand situations like that. And it'll just, you know, I'm hoping the hair on the back of their neck raises and, you know, they get the vibe of like, God, I can't wait till we can do that again. So let's take a, a step back here for a second, because it's 2021, which means that this is the 30th anniversary of the Shakespeare My Butt release. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any plans for Lois of the Low to do some kind of 30th anniversary celebration for that album? Yes, we are. Uh, we're this December, as I say, we're going to do a couple of things. I think we're going to celebrate the 30th anniversary as we're as we're picking out our rooms at the at the uh, assisted living centers. 30 years is a lot. It's like crazy to say it out loud, but yeah, 30 years. So we're going to be doing some celebrations of the record for sure. And we'll see in what capacity that is. Um, because it really is, as you, as you probably know, like it really is um, that record for us that is both a blessing and, and uh, you know, a shining moment and also a little bit of an albatross in terms of like we spent the rest of our recorded career trying to live up to uh, the explosion that happened for us in that moment, you know? which is a very difficult thing to do because, you know, I, I often uh, get in playful fights with people on the, on the uh, internet about Agitpop, our last record. I'm like, Agitpop's our best record by far, fight me, you know? <laughs> and it's the kind of thing where it's like, I really do believe Agitpop is our best record and our shining moment, but it has to go up against not only the songs on Shakespeare from my butt, but the memories people hold when they first heard it and lived it, you know? Uh, also including, like you're saying, all the moments they were 18 years old and, and uh, with no responsibility, standing in a bar somewhere, elbow to elbow with people as the rock, you know, hit them, you know, so. I, so. I, I, I think I will fight you on that, though, because me personally, Hallucigenia has been oh. one of my favorites. I mean, Agipop is great, but don't get me wrong. Agipop is great, but for, I guess Hallucigenia, because that was kind of like my first introduction oh. to Lowest right. of the Low. But that but that's just me. Um, but weirdo, you're a weirdo in the minority there, Jason. Uh, I yeah. I. I've been called a weirdo on many other things. I will hold myself to this one and uh, pr quite proudly so. But when you think about that Shakespeare My Butt album, I mean, like Chart Magazine back in 2000 listed this as number 10 
on the all-time Canadian albums list. So to have that kind of recognition of that album, you know, especially on the first one, like like again, like you mentioned, it as an albatross. Do you do you think that you know having that kind of you know recognition early on can be a weight on some bands? Oh, a hundred percent. I think it's uh you know, there's a, there's a hockey analogy. I, I was a goaltender when I was young and I think I can't remember when it was a couple of years ago, uh, St. Louis blues won the Stanley cup and Hellebuck, the goalie, it was his first year in the, in the NHL and he was unbelievable and they won the Stanley cup. And I sort of thought almost like Shakespeare, but so what does he do now? He just got into the NHL and he won the Stanley cup. It's like, okay, I guess put the skates on next year and win it again. Or, you know, it's like, I would think it's a bit deflating, you know, to sort of go, you want to sort of, you want to have a story that kind of like, and then we, you know, we mounted, you know, we mounted, we shot at the pillbox and we mounted that hill and we took the, you know, like you want to sort of chip away at the, at the territory. And uh, for us, yeah, we did that. And I think, you know, we were both, we were, we were young. So it's like, we were both unprepared for it and a little blase about it, you know, like we were unprepared for it. And because we had nothing else to compare it to, we sort of took it a bit for granted, you know, and we, went across the country and did what young bands do. We partied like crazy and we did all kinds of stupid things. And we, you know, we fought with each other about stupid little things that you shouldn't fight about. And, and then we released Lucy Genia, which was less well-received. It was pretty critically well-received, but it was less commercially well-received. And some people in our, you know, we suffered from that thing that bands sometimes do, which is it didn't sound a lot like the first record in terms of like, it was much bigger and much rockier, which is where we were kind of going. But for lots of our fans, they didn't want that or that that wasn't their, that's not what they loved about the first record. And so, uh, you know, we dealt with all that and then there was just brutal sort of machine touring all the time. And I think the combination of all that just ground us down. And, and, um, and as I say now, like a lot of people say this is that if anybody had had the wisdom or if we could look back and have the wisdom to say, guys, take four months off and just don't see each other for a while, then the band probably in that form would probably still be together today, but we just ground it down and, you know, it, it was pretty brutal. It was a brutal, you know, it was brutal. Jordan, Jordan Bennington, Cam Ward, goalies like that, getting the, the lowest of the low. That That's pretty much the most Canadian. Yeah, thing it was Bennington. It wasn't. It wasn't yeah. All. I was going to say, that, uh, maybe the most Canadian analogy of an album I think I've ever heard is comparing <laughs> it to a hockey goalie. Um, but, you know, as as you go through the years of Lowe's of the Low, because, you know, there was on again, then off again, then on again, then off again. You know, how much of that was the rigors of touring? How much of that was, you know, uh, again, just, just the grind of like what an album cycle is? Yeah, that, that album cycle grind. You know, I always say that we're, you know, we're in the we're in the music industry, but we're not of it in terms of like there are many, many things about my worldview and about the band's worldview that doesn't jive with, you know, not only does it not jive with the music industry, it doesn't jive with capitalism and the society that we live in to begin with. So not only do we have to deal with seeing the world in a different way, I think, than the the industry wants us to look at it. We just made decisions that were right for us, but that were pissing off the machine all the time. Every time we said something or did something, it was kind of pissing off the industry because that's not the way you do it and they know what they're doing and of course they know what they're doing they know what they're doing inside the structure of how they sell things and we wanted to to do it in a different way and it was just i would joke that you know four guys in the band it would be like our manager and the label anytime they said anything eight middle fingers would go up you know it was like there wasn't a middle finger left down you know for most things which came out you know was things like well for instance hallucigenia that record was written uh months and months and months and months before we were allowed to release it because they kept saying, no, no, I think we got another Shakespeare tour. You know, there are people in Timmins that haven't seen it. And there are people, you know, and we would always say like, God bless the people in Timmins. Um, but we have a fan base already that is rabid and has, and got us here. And we, we need to honor them. You know, they want new, new music. We have new music. We want to get that new music to them, you know? And so we would get stopped up by the machine sometimes that way. And, you know, and then we did lots of things on purpose to piss people off. Like when our um, we our manager organized a, an industry showcase to see if there are any labels that would want to sign us after Shakespeare. And we were on the road and we found these SST t-shirts in, a, in an indie rec- record store that said, you know, don't suck corporate cock and, you know, corporate rock sucks. And, and somebody in the band, it could have been any of us because we all sort of thought this way. It was like, we got to we got to wear these t-shirts at our industry <laughs> showcase, right? 
so we did lots of stuff like that just because we thought it was funny and and you know the internal logic was that if somebody doesn't if somebody in the industry doesn't find that funny then we're gonna have to deal with them every day and it's gonna be a nightmare anyway so we need to find the person who finds that funny and then we can work with them right so those aren't usual decisions a band makes you know usually bands are just happy to get whatever help and success they can get and we weren't like that we were just like we want the success on our own terms and so that ground us down quite a bit and um you know we were having lots of fights and then there was internal fighting and then there was substance abuse and then there was the usual rigors of you know having an apartment in toronto that you're never in because you're on in a van all the time and it's a grind you know when, when you think about you know the songs you know in your category or your catalog not just lowest of the low but with rusty nails and with the do good assassins you know the term wordsmith comes up quite a bit you know uh, like the the literary musical genius uh, you know, a cross between a, a Leonard Cohen and a Greg Graffin from Bad Religion. How important is it to you that you know you have that 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 literary style to those songs? Um, well, it's 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 very important to me in terms of like I guess that's my authentic voice. You know, I was working a long time. Uh, I had a band called Social Insecurity which was followed by a band called Popular Front. And David Alexander, the drummer in the low, was in both those bands. And then Steve Stanley jumped on with Popular Front. So the same unit, we, you know, Steve and Dave and I had been playing, uh, Dave and I since 83, and then Steve and I and Dave through the 80s. And I was writing the same writer, same, guy, same major people in the band, but our bands weren't really uh, getting anywhere, right? They weren't really uh, resonating with people. You know, it was it was on us. It wasn't any anything other than we weren't making something that was resonating enough with people. And part of that was because I was writing songs about sort of macro issues, you know, which was, you know, part of the thing of the day. Like if you look at early U2 stuff and everything, like we were talking about South Africa and we were talking about union politics and the Sandinistas and stuff like that. Just, and, and not, not necessarily that I'm saying that I didn't know about those things because I was very interested and in, read up and, you know, and demonstrated, got very uh, active in the street and politics and stuff like that. But it just was like writing that way uh, didn't set a fire uh, where it had to, you know, like in the, in which, I don't know which shocker it is, which music shocker it should be, but, you know, it just wasn't lighting people's hearts on fire. It was maybe lighting some people's brains on fire, but that's not what music should do. Right. It, and so for whatever reason, I, I had a breakup with a, for a, a very long term relationship. I had a breakup in about 89 or early 90 and I moved in with a bunch of punk rock dudes in, in a crappy little squat house. And I just started writing differently. And that's like the stuff that started to happen for Shakespeare. And my but it was almost like taking the big macro thing and just suddenly it came right down to my life. It was like, well, I can, I can still say the things I want to say about these issues, but just through the lens of my, of my block instead of the globe, you know? And it seemed like when I, the minute I did that, our success rate, like we changed them. Dave always talks about we're the first rebrand in history because the end of Popular Front wasn't too different than the beginning of, so, of uh, Lois of the Low. And in fact, two of the songs on Agitpop that are my favorite, uh, When She Falls and Night of a Thousand Guns, are from Popular Front, like 1988. And they are two of, the, two of people's most favorite songs on that record. So as I say, there wasn't a big change, but it was just like suddenly this resonated with people. They're like, ah, you know, this really speaks to my heart. Maybe it speaks to my head too, but it speaks to my heart, which is the most important thing. And I think I just stumbled into my true voice, which is like, you know, you're not a, you're not an academic. Ac I'm not even gonna try and say that word. You're not a, you're not a you know, like a, a philosopher. You're not a, a professor. You're a rock musician. So talk like a rock musician and speak to people, you know. And it doesn't mean you can't get big ideas through. It just means get them through in a way that that will resonate with people. You know, when you take a look at you know the way the songwriting goes for Lois of the Low, for your solo albums, for Rusty Nails, and then for the Duke of Assassins, do you change the approach in the way you write a song for the different outfits? Uh, not not often. I mean, not not very consciously and not very often. But I would say my general thing is just to write. I just write songs all the time. And, um, you know, every now and then there are things that might have been on a low, so the low record that wound up becoming a, a Do Good Assassin song or something. Uh, and that would that might only just be a matter of who's available to record at any time. 
you know, so it's as easy as that sometimes. And then there are songs, sometimes I'll write a song and I'll go, well, that is, there's, that's not, nothing other than a lowest of lows. That has to be a lowest of low song or it has to be a dude assassin song. Uh, and I'd say the only time it was very, very specifically geared was with the Rusty Nails because there was a very distinct kind of template with the Rusty Nails. We had the two, we had two baritone saxes uh, in that band and everything kind of swung in a different way than Los Delo does. And uh, there was maybe more of a groove and more kind of, not that Los Delo doesn't have soul that way, but the Los Delo soul is kind of like punk soul, kind of train and vein kind of soul, whereas the Rusty Nails were kind of old school soul, you know, Motown-y thing. So I, I would write things specifically for the Rusty Nails, but other than that, it's just a mishmash of, you know, tag. We're talking with Ron Hawkins, uh, lead singer of Lowest of the Low with the Duke of Assassins. Uh, we're celebrating the, the upcoming record store release day. This is the Major Mixtape Podcast. We're going to take a break and we're going to come right back with more Ron Hawkins. And that is why Rocky Road is definitively the best ice cream. Fine, I'll give you that if you agree that... If you say that the Toy Story's toys are not alive one more time, I will shove Rex up your... Do you miss sitting around the table getting into long debates about meaningless nonsense? Toys do not have souls! So, are we getting hot wings? Then you need the Moral Combat Podcast, where we take all of your favorite pop culture arguments and debate them tournament style. Except while we argue, it's our audience that determines the winner. I used to have trouble sleeping, I just couldn't turn off my brain. Now I drift off planning my own Moral Combat arguments. I often have strange opinions, but can't share them with my family without being disowned. So I call the Moral Combat Hotline. They have to listen. And now I can attend Thanksgiving. Before I started listening to Moral Combat, I had no friends or confidence. Now it feels like I have six new friends and only one of them is imaginary and speaks in parcel tongue. Now I don't have to be the bad guy in my marriage. They can tell her how bad her taste in movies are. Recorded live via Twitch every week, come hang out and get back to discussing the important things. Available on all podcatchers by searching Moral Combat Pod. Thanks, Moral Combat. Combat. Follow us at Moral Combat Pod on all social media platforms or go to our website, www.moralcombatpod.com to find out if we're right for you. Side effects may include shouting at your listening device, replicating similar arguments with your loved ones, voting on multiple platforms for the same matchup, submissions of your own picks, urges to leave voicemails, desires to guest host, pondering who hurt Greg, and many, many more. All right, welcome back to the Major Mixtape Podcast. Our guest today, lead singer of Lowest of the Low, Ron Hawkins. I do have to ask, when it comes back to, like, the music that you listened to early on, how much of that influenced how you write today? And what were some of those albums that, you know, you would kind of listen to at a younger age that influenced the way you write music? Yeah, I think, I, I think for me, I don't, and I, I would assume for most people, but I think for me, for sure, it's like that early stuff gets in you, gets inside you and it becomes uh, not conscious anymore. It's just part of the fabric. It's in, in so deeply embedded in your brain that forevermore, you know, you'll discover other things you like and maybe you'll try and, as the Beatles used to say, sort of nick something from here and nick something from there and, you know, put it in the gumbo and and, and it becomes something. But I think you, you wind up falling back on the foundation that was built, you know? And for me, those were like uh, long drives when I was, uh, when I was young, when I was like really young, like seven, eight, nine, we used to go up to my grandmother's cottage and every now and then I would go up with my uncle and my aunt and my uncle was a huge Beatles fan, Beach Boys fan, and my aunt was a huge Motown fan. So there would be songs in the in the station wagon on the way up, we would, and we would sing all the way up. And that's and I think that was, you know, and they were also both very musical. So so it was a matter of they were singing harmonies, and I would be <clears throat> even at that age trying to pick out harmonies, you know, to sing. And I think it's like that, you know, people ask me like, did you ever go to mu- did you ever take music or did you go to music school? And and uh, I say no, but I did drive up in the station wagon, which was a kind of music school, you know, and I, I remember early on just taking apart those songs, like at the end and fighting with my uncle when I was very young and now seems very weird, but uh, at the end of good vibrations, there's a lot that, you know, when it kicks back in the theremin's going, Ooh, there's a thing that goes, da, 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 da. And I remember getting an argument with him. I said, that's a cello. And he said, he said, no, it's a bass. And I was like, it's a cello for sure. Right. And it, that's a weird thing to argue about when you're 10 with your uncle, but so that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, there was the Beatles, of course, I think are the foundation for an awful lot of people because you hear them, you know, they're uh, as revolutionary as they were. I mean, there's something childlike about the Beatles. So I think everybody's parents and grandparents don't mind if the kids are listening to the Beatles, you know, 
but and so the kids are getting schooled in music i mean nobody did it better in terms of like creating new things uh making the textbook of how music pop songs at least should be written so that goes in there and then when i was about 15 16 i was a very political kid so i, I got aware of punk rock and then i got aware of the clash specifically and what i liked about the clash was uh, it was the first time the key turned in my brain like i could take my activism and my political uh desires and i could meld them they don't have to be different like i could meld them with the music you know and that could be a thing so i think those are the three you know beach boys for vocal stuff and and uh counterpart and harmony and just structure beatles for songwriting blueprints in every situation and then clash for passion and commitment and uh and as I say, eight middle fingers, that's probably where I got that from the class, you know? When you think about that first album, because everyone has that moment where they take their own money and they go to the record store and they buy that first album for themselves. Nothing that was given to them, but actually like, you know, claiming their own first album for themselves. Do you remember that moment for yeah, yourself? Yeah, for sure. It's a weird one now in hindsight, but it was uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, and it, they were doing a cover of Got to Get You Into My Life, the Beatles tune. And there's just, because I was stunned by the, you know, ba -da 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 -da, ba -ba -ba, you know, all that horn stuff blew my mind. And it was like, uh, and it's funny because I'm, if you'll see it, people who follow the whole catalog of songs or albums I've released and everything, there's a lot of horn stuff across the board, not just in the Rusty Nails, which was set up to be horns, but like it creeps in and everything, all the solo stuff and more and more it's in the lowest, the lowest stuff as we, as we move on. And the next record, we've already got a bunch of songs for another studio record. And, you know, we have a, a unit that we call the legitimizers who come and play with us. And, you know, I call them legitimizers because I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter how much we screw up on stage. If those horns are playing, we sound like a real band. You know? <laughs> so they're all over the new one, too. It's like, so I think that's what I mean. I think it goes into your subconscious, you know, so I'm interested in vocal harmony, counterpoint. I'm interested in the kind of I'm interested in pop songs, even though I like to come at it from, I think, a punk rock place and then imbue it with that clash passion and then horns and stuff like that so it's all these little as you say little crackers little bits and pieces from way back when i was little that are still in there and that have informed everything you know when you listen to music today you know what is it that 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 you know kind of sparks you know your your you know not, not inspiration but basically sparks your interest in the song do you find it's the riff the chord change or the lyrics well, I think it's all of it. Like I'm, I'm just in love with it. You know, I'm in love with it. And I think the, the, the thing about being in love with a person or in love with art or in love with an idea is that if you, you don't want to pick it apart too much into the component parts, you know, because, you know, there's a great Billy Bragg line about, you know, don't want to take it apart because it never fits back together again. And it's, I feel like that is that when I hear new music, I don't think too much about it. It's like, and oftentimes it's a riff and oftentimes it's an attitude. You know, sometimes it's even just an attitude. Even if I listen to the lyrics and I'm like, well, the lyrics are a bit embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't write that. But, uh, but the attitude is there, you know, that'll work for me or, and it doesn't matter what it is because, you know, I'm 56 now and I'm, and so when you get to that age, you do get surrounded by people, certainly not my friends, but other people of my uh, vintage, you know, you start seeing all the time on Facebook, but there's not, you know, they stopped making good music in night. And, and I'm like, what, when in your twenties, when you're in your twenties, cause it's just so predictable. People are like, you know, that's when the best music was written. You know, every generation says when, no, that's not when the best, that's when you could, that's when you were most limber and your knees didn't hurt. That's what you're actually saying, you know, because there's so much amazing music being made now. And I have a 15 year old daughter. She likes to make a Spotify playlist and stuff like that. When we drive to the cottage and a lot of the stuff, it's, you know, my partner and I have never heard it and it's all, great she has great taste you know and she listens to everything she listens to bowie and clash and you know nirvana and she's got a really wide range but all the new stuff that she brings to us in these car rides it, you know it's almost like a beautiful uh, full circle back to driving up to the cottage with my uncle you know she she brings stuff and we listen to it and sing it in the car and you know and kind of like you know the whole circle of like everything kind of you know what you had as a kid, now you you are able to give to your kid, which is great. When it comes, or she's giving to me, you know, exactly, cool, you know, yeah. When it comes to like just the embrace 
of lowest of the low by by fans and like pretty much all, all of Canada itself. There are a couple of things that really uh, kind of stick out for me. As someone who used to play hockey yourself, how cool was it when you know lowest of the low music or your music was on Hockey Night in Canada? Yeah, we've had a couple of, of things happen, which is that uh, both, uh, both through our friend Tim Thompson, who's a filmmaker, uh, Boundless Productions, he used to do the bumpers. There used to, when Hockey Night in Canada was still owned by whoever it was owned by CBC or Hockey Night in Canada, he used to do these little bumpers, and it was always indie rock bands, uh, little you know bumper at the beginning. And um, Ron Ron McLean one one show introduced uh, Lowest of the Low. I think it might have been the 20th anniversary of Lowest of the Low, of Shakespeare Movie And um, so we were we were on one of those little bumpers. And um, it's funny because as a hockey player, as a former, like I was a goalie, so there's a weird thing about goalies, which is that they're not quite uh, like uh, hockey players in a way. They're kind of like pitchers or like quarterbacks or something. They're kind of stuck off to the side you know, doing their weird eye exercises or whatever they're doing. They're in their own head kind of thing and they need to be able to block out the world and stuff like that. So there's something weird and Jedi like about goalies. But um, so I don't, I, I, I didn't, I don't consider myself a hockey guy in terms of like, you know, when hockey day in Canada comes and they want to have all the indie rock bands, we always turn it down. And so I was like, I don't, I don't want to be a hockey rocker. You know, my, my music career and my hockey career are completely different things. But when they come together like that, uh, you know, it was pretty cool because Ron McLean was kind of almost like melding the Leafs and Lois the Low as parts of the tapestry of Toronto. And that's kind of a cool thing. And then, you know, Peace and Quiet has been being used as a, as a piece of music to another film that Tim made, uh, the vibe of which is, you know, he, he focuses on the line in the song, uh, you know, this time we'll get it right which is very applicable to the Leafs. And unfortunately this year they didn't get it right again. So we'll probably be playing that song next year as well. But um, perhaps one day, perhaps one day. <laughs> yeah. And this, this speaks to what we were saying about lyrics and how, and how personal it is to people is that the lyrics in that song get uh, work very well in that context with that film, because Tim made them work that way. And because lyrics are subjective and they can be interpreted in a lot of ways and they interpreted it, for Hockey Night Canada as um, as a tragic, you know, a bittersweet Leafs story, you know, and it's really got nothing to do with that. It was written about a friend of mine and and, and written about Kensington Market in Toronto as, as a strange place that is, uh, you know, both sort of hectic and noisy. But for me, when I lived there, it was very much a, maybe it's a goalie thing again, but very much a Zen kind of, you know, place. So that's another thing about interpreting, you know. Speaking of uh, the song Peace and Quiet in Kensington Market, there was a street sign put up in Kensington Market with, you know, some of the lyrics from that song. How special a moment was that to have, you know, the place that the, the song is kind of inspired by to have that embrace that? Yeah, that was a real, you know, the, the idea of, I mean, obviously the chart thing, you know, 10th, what I don't know how to phrase it, but, you know, 10th most important Canadian record of all time, you know, that that cannot can't help but blow your mind a bit but at the same time i recognize it's a magazine it's a poll it's fleeting you know and then you know 10 years later it's you know the most important record is drake you know (laughs) drake is number one and whoever and you know whether you like that or you don't like that so I, i recognize how fleeting that is but when something like that when a sign goes up in a neighborhood i lived in because i wrote a song about that neighborhood and i'm considered you know a ghost that will haunt that neighborhood whether i'm there or not you know, that's really fantastic because it really speaks to the power of songwriting. It's probably what I, what I imagined when I was 16 or 17, I would love my music, to, that kind of effect I would love my music to have. But, you know, I'm always saying when you're 16 or 17, you talk a good talk and you, and you sort of like, you're faking it to make it and you're being all blustery and everything, but kind of deep in your mind, you never really think that's going to happen. <laughs> How could it happen? So then when it does, you know, uh, it just transports me back to that, little insecure dude you know and just go there you go buddy you you made it and then you got a sign let's talk a little bit about your artwork and how that kind of developed and and how it you know how that especially carried you through you know the last year and a half yeah so that's something that uh, this is another beautiful thing about humans is that i you know i was a 
I drew a lot as a kid, like a lot of kids do, and I was fairly good at it. And then I sort of, it slipped off. I was playing hockey and I was doing a bunch of other things. And so in my later childhood and in my teens, teens, I didn't really do much of it, but I always loved art and I hadn't really done any painting. I think I had a couple of um, projects in art school and high school that I had to paint, but I, but other than that, I'd never really painted. But so for, for years from then on, in my young adulthood, through lowest to the low, through all that stuff, anytime I went anywhere in the world, I, I almost never went to see live bands, but I would always go to galleries. So that was a thing that was really, I was really into. And then when Jill and I got together and and uh, became a couple, very early on, we were at a, a show at the McMichael Gallery. I think it was George O'Keefe and Frida Kahlo or something like that. And I just made an off the cuff statement that, you know, every time I see painting, it looks so visceral. I really feel like, you know, must be awesome to do that. And then a birthday came up and she bought me, you know, we were both broke and poor and she bought me a lot of art supplies, you know, went into debt to buy me a lot of art supplies. And so I felt this pressure of like, Oh God, you know, like maybe what if that was just a flippant comment, you know, but here, but here it is, this, you know, wonderful person has was listening and fulfilled this. So I started painting it and I was on fire about it. And it became like, I became like a junkie with it. Like I was painting every single day. And, and it was one of those things. The reason I think it's such a beautiful thing is it was just uh, a skill and a, and a passion that was just lying latently inside me that I kind of knew I was into and everything, but never acted upon all my life. I never acted upon it. And then because somebody who loves me is listening and acts upon it, this whole thing, you know, this whole dam bursts open and I'm doing a whole other thing I never would have done, which is, you know, amazing. So then I did that. And the focus of that stuff early on was always portraiture. And I, I always likened it like, you know, it seems a lot like the lyrics I write, like I'm obsessed with people and what makes them tick, you know? And so the lyrics are stories about what makes them tick in a sort of literary way. And these are sort, sort of like, you can see in people's faces kind of what makes them tick and trying to capture that. And then uh, for the last two or three years, you know, music was so demanding and there was so much, and I had the Do Good Assassins and solo stuff and most of the low. It's like got too many bands on the go and feeding all the bands with songs and playing shows and everything that I wasn't painting for probably a couple of years, two and a half years, three years. And then boom, the pandemic hit. And it was like, well, now you have no gigs, dude, you know, and you got time to fill and everything. And right about that time, I had also another friend of mine had given me a book about the women of the, abstract expressionist movement in the 50s and 60s and 40s and uh that was sinking in more and i was thinking about abstraction and everything and and then i started painting and then i started big painting these large-scale abstractions and the, again sort of got the same thing I'm kind of on fire about that idea and going down that rabbit hole and and so that led to just painting non-stop through the, through the pandemic which as i said you know i think the key element of the pandemic for me why it hasn't been the burden that it has been on so many people is every morning my eyes open and I go, Oh, you know, what are we going to do today? Oh, I got lots. I've got this, 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 I've got a list of things. Right. And that gets you through the day. And I, I do have to say that, you know, having seen some of the artwork that you've put up on your website, it is stunning. It is, you know, you have oh. a, you know, an absolutely great eye for it, but because it's been kind of one of those, like, you know, again, personal things is it something that you you know aside from putting you know putting some of it on your website is that something you want to keep to yourself or do you see somewhere down the road maybe doing a gallery showing or maybe a coffee table book of some of the work that you've done yeah both of those things like i i have done a couple of, of coffee table books for portraiture stuff uh years ago i had a, a a show called a to z which was you know a is for amy it was amy winehouse and you know M is for McGowan. There was a Shane McGowan portrait and they were all small portraits like this. So I did one for every letter of the alphabet and I made a coffee book table out of that. And then I had another show called Sabotage, which was a gallery show of large scale portraits. And I've got a, a coffee table book about that. And uh, yeah, and, and I've been painting through the pandemic for a show that we might do, um, might be like a three man show. Me and Greg Smith, who plays bass in the low and Dave Alexander, who plays drums. Dave went to OCA uh, or OCAD, I guess it is now. And Greg's been painting for a very long time. So we're going to do a three person show in a gallery at some point when we can open up and do that. And I've got the paintings. I have a storage space actually where nine of the 10 of my paintings are already in there because I've been working on that. And then I've been doing lots of commission work as well and putting up the stuff, the other stuff, just putting it up. And as I say, luckily for me, you know, I, I put them up at 10 o'clock and by that night I have a couple of bids on them and stuff like that. So I've been selling all the stuff I've been painting. 
which is good economically, but it's also good because we have a very small house. <laughs> <laughs> so it keeps them going out the door instead of piling up. We had uh, previously on the show, uh, Ken Tizard from the Watchmen. Uh, and he was telling us about how you lent your voice to his all together now uh, album. Mm. So when you get invited to, you know, partake in, you know, in, you know, basically be a guest on someone else's album. How, how special is that to you and how much, you know, pressure, you know, do you internalize to want to make sure that you put the best out there for them? Uh, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's great because also it, because it was virtual, you know, like we, we couldn't go to a studio together. So it was like, I was getting files sent to me and I have a little, little studio eight by eight studio in my basement where I've produced records for other people and made some of my own records down there. Um, and, and a lot of musicians have that scenario because it's so easy now with digital recording. So a lot of it was that, like I was excited to hear the files as they came in, you know, get them up and hear what they sound like. And there was so many talented people working on it that, uh, and I really liked Ken a lot. He was, uh, he was just lovely um, putting it together. And, um, and I got to sing uh, on Working Class Hero, the John Lennon song, which is one of my favorite all time songs by him in terms of like i think it says so many things i know a lot of people get their knickers in and not about john having a rolls royce and everything and singing those those lyrics but sometimes it's right anyway even even if maybe <laughs> from a a questionable place uh, so i love that song and it was really great to sing it i also got to do uh sunday bloody sunday for um david botchel who produced agitpop of the last low record uh, he was putting something together for Music Matters, which is a thing that he's involved in. Uh, so that was another one like that. Yeah, that's great. It's great to do. And it is challenging. And of course, but I, I come back to the goalie thing too, which is that one thing that that taught me uh, was, you know, I know it's funny because there's sometimes there's a real schism, maybe not so much now, but when I was younger, there was a real schism between people who were jocks or sporty people and people who were artists, you know, the artists all had to look like Robert Smith and the jocks all had to have, you know, no neck and a crew cut, you know, just so care. And for me, like going through hockey, like I learned so many things uh, playing hockey that apply to being in a band, you know, like getting along with your teammates, pulling together as a team, you know, struggling against adversity together and, and maximizing each person's skills to do something. So lots of things there that you can learn. And I was luckily enough to be enough of an art kid and enough of a jock that I could walk down the middle and not, you know, get my head stuck in a toilet by the jocks or be ostracized by the cool art kids. Um, but yeah, so that kind of stuff is great to work together with people like that. You know? I, I think it's, it's come to the point though, where it's time to sit down with the main question of the show. So if you, Ron Hawkins had to introduce yourself to a total stranger, but instead of saying, hi, I'm Ron. How you doing? By the way, I'm awesome. Um, you hand them a mixtape. And on that tape are songs that tell the story of you. What songs are on that tape and why are those songs there? Uh, let's see. It's such a, well, uh, one song that I think speaks to me, uh, A Case of You by Joni Mitchell from the Blue Record. That, that record though I think some people are surprised when I mention it as a major foundational influence in my songwriting, because I'm not sure it's clear to carry over to the way I write from that record, but it, I don't know why it hit me so hard that record when I heard it. And I just uh, binge listened to it for years, you know, because something about that record spoke to me so much and how, how she told those stories. So that uh, I could drink a case of you and still be on my feet. That really stuck in my head, that line. And just the whole that whole idea uh, about being intoxicated by another person uh, and obsessed in a good way, in a healthy way. So that one's for sure. Um, God only knows by uh, I, I, you know, say the Beach Boys. I think the Beach Boys sang on it, but it's mostly Brian Wilson and uh, and the Wrecking Crew. But um, God only knows is is always up in my top three songs, just because of the orchestration of that song and and how singable it is. And how um, you know how how simple it seems. It's it's almost like that song is almost like a, like watching a pro tennis player or something. You you know, you look at them and you go, I could do that, <laughs> you know, and and you cannot do that. And it's like 
trying to, I remember we, we did it as a cover. I was doing something called the acoustic review. Uh, Lawrence and I went out and did a lot of my catalog, just stripped down acoustically and with violin and stuff like that. And we decided to do that song. And I thought, Oh yeah, I know God only has been listening to it all my life. And I started to learn it. And then I was like, wow, there's some very difficult um, transitions from chords and notes in chords that you don't expect are there. And then there's a key change in the middle of it that doesn't really, when you hear it, doesn't really sound like a key change. So there's a lot of very fancy stuff going on under the hood, but it just seems like a beautifully hummable song. I think it's a perfect song that way. Like, you know, it's got something for everybody. Uh, and though I'm a, you know, I'm an atheist. I mean, I, I love, I, I sort of love the, uh, I just love the sentiment of it. I think you can, you can take a secular uh, idea away from that song, you know, just in terms of how, you know, as Joe Strummer would say, without people, you're nothing, you know, and it's like, we can all count the people in our lives that if they weren't there, it would be very hard to get through this battle, you know? So that one, um, there's countless Clash songs, but, uh, you know, something like Spanish Bombs, I, I was uh, was obsessed with the Spanish Civil War uh, when I became a, you know, a very young leftist. It, it, it's I think when anybody gets into socialism or starts to read Marx or Lenin or Trotsky or anybody like that, it's not too long before the Spanish War comes up because it's such a tragic moment in history where it looks like, uh, you know, people who believe in, in, in socialism, it's the place where it lived and died in possibly its, its most uh, possible uh, true form. Because of, obviously, if you look at the Soviet Union, it's, it's a debacle and, a, and an absolute uh, spit in the face of socialism on paper or Maoism or whatever. But in Spain, it looked pretty, it's romantic. It's people came from all over the world against the laws of their own country to go and fight and help the leftists there and the duly elected government there. So it's very romantic. And the fact that the Clash had a song, Spanish Bombs, uh, that blew my mind. And then that led to me writing this kind of trilogy of songs, two of them that wound up on Shakespeare in My Butt. None of us can remember why the third one didn't go on there. But I think it was because we were playing it in Popular Front and we were so young and dumb and full of cum. We were like, you know, it's an old, it's, that's old. It's six months old. We can't put it on this record. But there's a letter from Bill Bow, uh, from the for the hand of Magdalena and Girona Train, a, a trilogy I wrote about the Spanish Civil War. So that's one Spanish bombs. Um, you know, there's things like Prince. Like I discovered Prince early on. Like I think Prince is the intro for Prince for a lot of people was Purple Rain, but like I was there like a couple of records before that because, and I don't know why it spoke to me as deeply as it did. But as a young punk dude, there was just something so audacious about him. You know, there he is on the cover in a speedo and a trench coat. And, I'm, you know, and then I was hearing these super dirty songs and stripped down funky things that, you know, sometimes it would just be like, he would just make decisions like, this is a super groovy, soulful song. Um, and I'm not going to put a bass in it. It's like, who doesn't put a bass in a dance, soul dance song? But, uh, you know, so songs like um, When You Were Mine, that's a great tune. I don't think it has a bass in it, but uh, the drum machine, a telly and a vocal. But there's just something about him that I was like, wow, you know, him and, and one of the very early uh, hip hop bands, Houdini, I used to, I, I had those cassettes I would play all the time and they were sort of formative in their way, I guess, um, because I think my stuff always swings, even when it's rock stuff. I think there's a swing in there. I'm always, when we're, when we're learning the songs in the rehearsal space, the band's always going, you know, when you hit that chord, you know, do you, what's the phrase? Like, do you, uh, is it anticipated? Like, do you jump into it or does it wait till the one? And I'm like, it's always anticipated because that, that swing is always there, right? The kind of, um, I don't know, to keep it jumping, but so that, you know, and then more, more, uh, more currently, uh, there, there's a woman named Margaret Glaspie who's, who's, she has a song called Emotions in Math and, uh, songs like that, you know, where it'll just hit me like, wow, that's, that's in there. That's in the pantheon for me. It's a fantastic song. And I think what you were saying about, um, is it riffs? Is it this or that? There's a great riff and she plays guitar in a way I've never heard anybody play guitar before. So there's a riff that she does. And the way she plays that riff uh, is so singular to her. And her voice is very, um, very distinct as well. So I look for that too. Sometimes that will hit me strongly, like a very distinct voice. Well, Tom Waits too, like uh, I got super obsessed with the rain dogs record so there's a song like like time 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 on 
that would be on a mixtape for sure. That's such a gorgeous, and I love his, you know, undeniably gorgeous, undeniably beautiful, undeniably romantic songs uh, sung to you by a trash compactor. You know what I mean? Like, it's like the trappings are so weird sometimes and his voice, it's almost like sometimes you're like, he's challenging us to like this song. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's got this beautiful song and now he's going to, he's like, okay, there we go. We got that. Now I'm going to record it in a way that's so challenging to like, <laughs> you know, that it'll only be the true believers that'll be there. And, you know, I'm going to hit these oil barrels. I'm going to bang on the radiator, you know? So that one time, time, time would be in there. You know, I, I'm sure if we did this interview every day, there would be 10 different songs, but uh, <laughs> those are all in there. Okay. So one more question for you here. And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit on this one here. So, it's okay if you need to take a little bit of time over you just can't I've decide the, i've been on the spot before <laughs> but if you go through your entire discography okay again lowest of the low rusty nails do good assassins solo stuff all the songs that are in there if you <laughs> had to make put together a ron hawkins three song sampler of the songs that you are most proud of what would be there oi uh i told you i was gonna put you on the spot <laughs> You did put me on the spot. I think undoubtedly, for whatever reason, Peace and Quiet would be there. Um, I, you know, sometimes I'm, if you ask me that question, I would sometimes, pardon me, would be thinking outside of myself and go, well, Rosie and Gray, you know, just because of, you know, I get, I get influenced by the external world's experience of my songs, you know, like just from what other people say about them or what they mean to other people. So like something like that, but I wouldn't pick Rosie and Gray, but I understand it would be one that people might want on there. But for me, Peace and Quiet, um, I remember when I first was singing it, um, I was, I had a bunch of songs for the Chemical Sounds record that I was recording, a solo record, and and the drummer, uh, Mark Hansen, he was a drummer in the Rusty Nails. We were in a jam space and, and he was just learning the songs. And I had a bunch of the songs that are on that record. And I said, oh, I got this bit. And I wasn't even sure about it. And it was like, bum, 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 bum. I started playing Peace and Quiet. And he put his sticks down at some point and he's like, are you, crazy like he's like you have to go home right now and finish that song and i was like really he's like he's like yeah this is one of the best songs you've ever written right so i went home and finished it and then i remember doing it live and i don't know what it was but it was one of those things where the hair would raise on the back of my neck and i would start to there's a couple times where i would start to well up um and it's not because of what i'm singing it's not because of what it's about but it's just a feeling something almost like something about the vibration of the sounds the sounds i chose or whatever it was making me very emotional to sing it so i knew that was a real moment you know so that one for sure peace and quiet would be there um i feel like night of a thousand guns which ironically i was saying you know wrote, wrote it in about 88 or 89 or something and then it didn't make it to a record until 2018 or 19. um i think that song is a perfect frankenstein monster of all the things i love about what we've been talking about which is that it grooves it's got a great groove uh, it's got some playful stuff like the Latin percussion and the horns and everything. And um, it says something that's important to me about liberalism and about, you know, coming together as a community and stuff like that. And it's really fun to, uh, to sing. And, and, and there's a certain swagger in it that I like, you know, I, I joke, I often joke about sometimes I write songs where I'm like, it'll look really good when I, if I stand like this while I'm singing it, you know, <laughs> you know or a friend of mine, Steve um, often says, you know, there should be full length mirrors in guitar stores because you, you want to see how you look, you know, <laughs> standing in certain poses with that guitar. So it seems, so for me, it's got all that stuff, the swagger. I like to jump around the swagger of that song. And so that's another one. And then maybe for number three, um, I mean, I could go to barricade on agit pop as well, just because I felt like I finally got a chance to, you know, hit the caps lock on capital P politics in that song and say the things kind of straight up, no chaser, the way I wanted to say them about what I believe about democracy in the societies we live in, that on on lots of levels, they're not very democratic. And we're, you know, we're hearing all the stuff from the states about voters' rights that they're fighting for and how they're trying to kill voters' rights and narrow it down to just a group of people in power. But, um, and that song was a song, it's the first time I think I ever had a, not a fight, but I had a, a, a real discussion with the band members, some of, some of who didn't like the idea of, you know, my next vote is with a brick. You know, uh, there's a line in there, um, some vote with their heads, some vote with their hearts, 
Some vote with the end of their dicks. You can vote with a ballot. You can vote with your wallet, but it's always a vote for the pricks. So let me tell you this for free. My next vote's with a brick <laughs> from somewhere beyond the barricade. And so, you know, a lot of people didn't like the the producer, David Botchel, wasn't sure either. And we had some deep discussions about, should I change that line? My next vote's with a brick because they didn't like the implied violence of it or something. And I said, you know, this is the first time I've got gotten to say this uh, in modern times with my music uh, that, you know, everybody who knows me knows I'm a, I'm a pacifist. I'm not a violent guy, but that everything we stand on and everything we take for granted, whether it's labor rights or socialized medicine, most of those things were fought for. Some of them were fought for with violence. Some of them were fought for with implied violence. And that if we look at BLM last summer, you know, things start to change. You know, Derek Chauvin got, got convicted partially because millions of people went into the street and there was a certain implied violence to the people at the top that if something doesn't change for the better for the vast majority of these people, there's going to be people with pitchforks and, you know, torches at the, at the palace. So I feel like that was a, that song, the barricade was the first time I really said, well, there you go. Bang. I locked, I locked it. You know, I got to say the way I've always meant to say it, you know, as someone it's horrible. I was going to say, as, as, as someone who, you know, obviously has their pulse on, you know, kind of the, the happenings of the world, do you find it tough watching the news when you just see the, the world not taking care of itself, whether it be through, you know, self-dealing politicians, through race issues, through, um, you know, through the, the indigenous issues that, that Canada is finding itself right now with the with the with everything that's going on with the, the, the sites of the residential schools? How tough is it? when you watch the news and you just see people not being good to each other. Yeah, it's exhausting. I'm sure it's exhausting for everybody to watch, no matter whether you, you know, you can't escape it. Like that's, I know lots of people who are like, Oh, I'm not into politics. It's like, well, you know, politics is into you. <laughs> you, know, you can't really ignore it because it's coming for you if you don't take part in some way. Right. So, um, but, but it's exhausting. I mean, and it's the kind of thing where, I can get myself worked up and down a rabbit hole of just being too aware of it. And it becomes kind of poisonous. You're kind of drinking some poison and sometimes I can't avoid it. And it's like this feedback loop of, you know, I, I care about it. So I can't not look, but the more I look, the more toxic it feels and the more down it can get you if you don't have, uh, other forms of energy feeding you. And th which is one of the reasons I, I, I say that, you know, music for me, like we were saying in popular front, I think I was getting it wrong in terms of like, I was trying to, you know, arrogantly didactically teach people and, and, you know, and who was I, I didn't have any answers. I was a kid who thought he, you know, who was beating his chest and thought he knew stuff. And I knew, you know, one one hundredth of what I thought I knew. So, that was the wrong way to approach it. The right way to approach it for me has been ever since, which is to create um, an energy field, to create art that hopefully feeds people uh, and is a counterbalance to that exhaustion. You know, hopefully it makes them happy. It makes them uh, energetic. It makes them want to want to take part. You know, now, now I can watch that stuff and figure out what I, what needs to be done and what my part of that is because I have this other stuff that feeds me and makes me strong. You know, these vitamins, this, these art vitamins or whatever. And I can go and do that stuff. But for me, yeah, it is, it's, uh, it's incredibly debilitating and exhausting. And um, I can understand when people get cynical very quickly because I have, I seem to have a boundless uh, fountain of optimism about humans. I really believe that we can do things collectively and that we can be good to each other. But, you know, I, uh, there's an awful lot of evidence that that's not true. <laughs> so I have to ride through that and just, you know, my friends help me, my family helps me stay strong and be, and be optimistic. And I still think, you know, that like, as I say, last summer was a big uh, inspiration to me just because of what was happening. And COVID in a weird way, uh, the good takeaway for me has been, it really shone a spotlight on some inequities in our society, you know, and, and recently, you know, this year with Canada Day, this was a great example of like, I feel like last Canada Day, the fireworks were going off everywhere. And, you know, and if you told anybody, oh, I'm, I don't want to wear a Canadian flag sweatshirt or I, I don't want to run a flag up my flagpole, you know, they'd be like, well, what are you crazy? You know, what do you, you know, you hate Canada? It's like, and this year it seemed like a very quick turn to a lot of people going, yeah, it's just, that's not cool to do that. You know, maybe we should just listen. Maybe we should shut up and chill out and listen. You know, we can drink beer next week. You know, we can shoot fireworks off whenever we want, but let's, let's 
be compassionate and listen for a change. And it seemed to happen on such a, such a large level that I was like, wow, that's a big paradigm shift right away. There's, that's a lot of people paying attention. You know? Ron, thank you so much for this. Uh, where can we find you on social media and what is next for Ron Hawkins? Uh, you can find me at ronhawkins.com just is my website that has all the stuff on it. Lowest to low, everything there's lowest to low.com for specifically lowest to low stuff. Uh, the Do Good Assassins can be found on Instagram and Twitter and Bandcamp. Um, and what's next? Well, what's next is uh, I've got a bunch of things in the fire. We got, we'll go back to this guy. This is July 17th coming out for Record Store Day. Um, I've got an EP that I'm working on uh, with Devin Lougheed, who was uh, in Sky Wallace's band. He's producing it, a six song EP that'll come out probably in 2022 at some point. And later this year, we're looking at releasing the double live Lowest to the Low record from two years ago at Lee's and the Horseshoe. More paintings. Cannot wait for that double album. Ron, thank you so much for this. This has been the Made You a Mixtape uh, podcast. If you are listening to us on an audio streaming service, then you can watch this entire interview over on YouTube. But if you're watching this over on YouTube, you can actually listen to us on an audio streaming service. And to all of our friends who are now listening to us in Italy, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been Made You a Mixtape. I'm your host, Jason. We'll see you next time. Take care.